It's good to have you in our Sunday School lesson for the 28th of April 2024 and our topic is how Christians demonstrate mercy. Let's pray. Father, we bring this study before you, O God, and pray, precious Holy Spirit, that you lead us. Open our eyes of understanding, circumcise our ears and our hearts, that you alone be given glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take our first reading from James chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. James 2, 1 to 6. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold ring in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you to courts? Okay. Now, this is a very, very important lesson. And God is going to help us. I don't know about you, but for me, it's a hard thing. I'm not a pastor. I've had a fellowship before. But it is difficult when somebody comes in Maybe somebody of substance, maybe somebody of title. Your essay comes into your church. Maybe a highly educated person, a doctor in the community. It is difficult for you not to notice them. And it is difficult, especially if they're just visiting or they haven't come before. They come, you want to treat them nice so that they can come again. You want to welcome them well. But a poor man comes in, maybe a mad person. It is difficult to sit them in front beside those special invitees, in quote. Therefore, my advice is, brethren, God says, don't discriminate against my people. Don't discriminate against the poor. Don't show favoritism. We need the grace of God. And we need the wisdom of God to obey this one. Let's leave it there. Maybe we'll pick it up again. But let us remember that before God, there are only two classes of people on earth. Two groups of people. Those that are saved. Those that are members of the house of God. Those that are members of the kingdom of God, whose names are written in the book of life. The saints of God. And the second class is those whose names are not in the book of life. Their names are in the book of Satan, in the book of hell. Those are the two classes that God sees. We can see more, but those are two classes. And let us look at James chapter, sorry, Matthew 18, Matthew 18, 3 to 6. And said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child, 
is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this, this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it will be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Okay, can you see where the problem is? Anybody who is a child of God, God values very, very much. God values his children. God is jealous over us. And God wants to protect us. Not just from dangers, outsiders. But God wants to help us to continue to stand for him. So that we can come to him in heaven. So that poor man that walks in is actually a child of God. That rich man that walks in, if he has given his heart to Jesus and is repented, is also a child of God. And God sees them equally. God sees them equal. No one is higher than the other in the eyes of God. Good parents don't discriminate against their children, even the naughty ones. That is why the Apostle James is saying, hey, somebody comes in and is an unbeliever and you're treating him better than your own brother or sister. My own people. God is not happy about it. Any child of God is somebody who has received the kingdom of God like a child. Childlike faith. Put his trust in God. Let us remember that when these epistles were written, there were few Christians who were rich. Majority of Christians were poor. And the people who were persecuting Christians and killing Christians even were rich people. That is where this analysis is coming from. And therefore, my brother, my sister, let us do our best. Let us ask for God's grace. Is as important as that. So that, as James also puts it, we don't do everything right and offend in one. Let us be very, very careful. When I got born again new, I was attending a fellowship and it really, really pained me that the, the brethren in the same fellowship, especially those ones that were, oh, those ones that were grown, I mean, they have been in the Lord for some time, and I was just new, both in the fellowship and in the Lord. And they will come to my block, go past my door, and go and visit another popular brother, three, four doors away. And then I'll hear their voice, they will stay there, and then they'll come back and go past my door and go without knocking and say, bro, how are you doing? I was young in the faith. And I thought, is this what they do? Is this what they do? I didn't like it. But God's grace kept me. But let me also say that what James was saying, he didn't say that if you're poor, Automatically, you're a child of God and you make heaven. No, there is no advantage. There's no spiritual advantage from being poor. No. If a rich man is a child of God, you are not better than him just because you are poor. You are poor. No, that's not what he's saying. A rich man can serve God. Serve God honestly. Serve God with his heart and with every I'm not talking about giving money. So let us not misunderstand what he is saying. Poverty only glorifies God if it makes you serve him with all your heart. Just like wealth can do the same. Praise the Lord. Now, 
Let us look at, read further James 2, the same chapter 2, verses 8 to 16. James 2, 8 to 16. If you really fulfill the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, <coughs> Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. <clears throat> what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Okay, where are, which verse are you reading? 14. Okay, go on. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to him, Depart in peace, be warm, and be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Okay, now... The Bible goes ahead to say, love your neighbor as yourself. Going from what we have been saying, if you love somebody, you will not discriminate against them. And there is discrimination everywhere in our society. We must do whatever we can not to join. The Igbo man is saying, oh, the other tribes, they're no good. They're inferior. Yoruba man is saying different things. That is not good. Even within the same tribe, people say, oh, we are superior. That village, don't go and marry somebody from there. They're not. And then, let us remember that this episode was written to Christians. So, let us not do that because we love our neighbor as ourselves. The second implication, he says, it is all or none. So, if there are ten commandments and you fulfill nine, and you fail one, you have failed, you, you are an offender. That's what James is saying. You are an offender. Therefore, it is dangerous and not try to say, well, all I do is just steal money now and again. The other person, ha, ah, he steals every day. He's a womanizer. He's a liar. So, I'm better. No, you're not. As long as you commit sin, you are, you have missed it before God. It's as simple as ABC. But if you're a child of God, let us remember that you're clean. It, this uh, scripture doesn't actu actually apply to a non believer. An unbeliever is a sinner, he lives insane. So whether he commits 10 or 100, it doesn't make any difference before God. He's talking about believers. But that is why he quickly adds, he says, mercy, grace, triumphs over judgment. If God was doing that, anytime you say, boy, anytime you will say, doy, then none of us will survive. Let us know that because of grace, because of the favor that God brought through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are forgiven, all of us. As soon as you say, God, I did that wrong, I'm sorry. You're forgiven. That's why he says that the mercy of God triumphs over judgment. In the Old Testament, this was the law that applied. Jesus hadn't come. So, anytime you sin, that sin is waiting for you. At the end of the year, the chief priest will atone for the sins 
of everybody in the country. Or you can go and offer something as well. But in the New Testament, it is all or none. When you commit one sin, you are a sinner, you, you fail all of them. Because God looks at black and white. Are you clean or are you not clean? That point is taken. Now, therefore, if God so forgives us, if God so quickly forgives us when we repent of whatever we have done wrong, be it frank sin or prayerlessness or not just being serious with God and so on and so forth. You come late to everything that God is doing. As soon as you repent, God forgives you. We must learn to forgive each other. We must learn to forgive each other. Praise the Lord. We cannot overemphasize this. Now, let us continue. James, the same chapter 2. Let us read from 17 to 22. Thus also faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know? O oh, foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? Okay, let us look at finally Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 8, verses 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay. Now, James says it, clearly, says it clearly, that faith without works is dead. And he talks about Father Abraham. This is again one of those scriptures that people don't quite understand. And if they're not careful, just that lack of knowledge as small as it seems, can send people to the wrong side of eternity. I want you, therefore, to listen. Some people think that the song that we used to hear, that song, as um, good as it sounds, is not actually scripturally right. So what it means is that for you a sinner to inherit the kingdom of God, you have to go do good deeds. And that is 100% wrong. No. Ephesians says that salvation is by grace. Therefore, as soon as you believe Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, yes? Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sins. Accept me as your child. You are saved. Your name is written in the book of life. It is as simple as that. You go to school primary one and they say what's your name and you say it how old are you you say it what's your address you say it and so on and so forth they look at your age they look at everything and they write your name in the register simple you have become 
a member of that school. You become a student. It's as simple as that. You don't need to do anything. The only thing you have done is exercise your faith to say, hmm, if I go to that school, they will accept me. That's faith. You're saved. So, when people repent, the only thing that qualifies them is the faith to receive the grace of God. And what is grace? God is giving you something that you do not merit. That is grace. Mercy is God not giving you the punishment that you deserve. If I just say, okay, this is a hundred naira. Somebody have it. And somebody runs from somewhere. I don't know him. And he grabs the ten naira first. He becomes his own. A hundred naira. Or a million naira is his own. He didn't work for it. All he did was exercise his faith, stretch off his hand, and grab it. That's all. That is faith. And that is the only thing that makes us children of God. Praise the Lord. Otherwise, the man on the cross, the thief, all he did was say to the other one, hey, shut up. You are dying, you're a thief. I'm dying, I'm a thief. This one hasn't done anything. Jesus didn't say a word at that point. Then he turned and said, Lord, remember me when you're in your kingdom. That was how he secured his salvation. That's how he got his name in the book of life. Finish. And Jesus turned and said, today, <laughs> You will be with me in paradise. When I die and you die, because of your confession now, you're a saint of God. We are going to, we are going to paradise. And on day three, when I resurrect, graves, the Bible says graves opened in Jerusalem. Saints, they came out. People saw them. It was time to take them from paradise below <laughs> to heaven proper. That man was with them. Who shall we mention? Ruth was a Moabite girl. Then, once you confess your faith in the God of Israel, you become a child of God. That was how it was done. You change nationality. That's what Ruth did. She became a child of God. So much so that her name for God wanted to demonstrate this fact. Her name, she was named among the books of the Bible. And among the, 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 in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Rahab, the harlot, harlot, harlot. <laughs> Again, that's how she bought her way. We know that your God is a true God. We know that God has given you the land. Please, can I join you? That was all. That was all. And by the way, he mentioned Abraham in this passage. Yes, Abraham was made righteous with God. Not because of all the good works he did. No, but because he believed God. And the Bible says it was counted to him for righteousness. The only thing that qualifies us for heaven is not works, it is faith. Praise the Lord. So where does work come in? Work is like the opposite size of the same coin. If you don't have a coin, just pick a, 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 a naira note. Give me that, give me some cash there. Just what? Opposite size, you cannot separate them. When you receive heaven, you become a, a child of God by faith. Then you receive the Holy Spirit and the grace to do good works. Look at that. Head or tail. You cannot separate this currency. If you, if you are able to delete or cancel one side, it is no longer what it is. So one side is faith. The other one is good works. They go together every time. That is why some people say, hmm, this brother, we don't even know whether he ever repented. Because that brother didn't let. After receiving Jesus by faith, 
he didn't continue to do his use his faith to do good works. They work together. God expects that if you have been being a Christian for one year, for two years, there should be a difference. There has to be a difference because the Jesus that you have received, the Holy Spirit that you have received, begin to help you. You are married from uh, America, white lady, and you arrive in Nigeria. You can't behave like an American. No. You begin to learn to eat gari to start with. You begin to learn the culture and the custom of the people. That's the works that we have to do. Therefore, the Bible says that faith without works is dead. If you don't begin to change and learn the culture, the, the character, and the behavior of heaven on earth, character of the kingdom, then people say, this one, uh, he goes to that church, but he doesn't behave like them. And they're right. They're right. Finally, the faith, the works that is expected of a child of God doesn't end in you becoming to live holy. In you becoming to learn to pray and to praise God. In you becoming to tell the truth instead of lying. It doesn't end there. We use the same faith that we have received to go and work and make money. To go and work and feed your family. That's why the Bible says that anybody who cannot provide for his own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Yes, you pray, God help me. I'm a farmer. Let my cassava grow well. But you have to go and plant the cassava anyway. That is where a lot of us have missed it. We go to night vigils and we expect God to throw that money. No, it doesn't work like that. God doesn't throw that money. God expects you to walk because he has promised to bless the work of our hands. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Let's pray. Are you born again? If you're not, it is simple. Lord Jesus, I come before you. I have had your word. I am a sinner. Forgive my sins. Write my name in the book of life. Cancel it from the book of death. From now on, give me grace to follow you to the end. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray. If you have said that prayer with your heart, don't go telling people that you're a sinner because you're not. You're no longer a sinner. You're a saint. You're now a child of God. And if that comes, you're going to heaven. Maybe next week. Maybe the week after we're going to talk about it. So that you'll be sure. Bible says I'm writing to you that, uh, that believe in the name of the Lord Jesus. That you may know. We need to know. We need to know. Father, in the name of Jesus, anybody sick that is hearing this word, please, I pray, stretch forth your holy hands and heal such a one. Thank you, Father. We have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen.